to Cloud and Queer, the podcast by SADA for innovative business leaders and technology enthusiasts, where we explore how Google Cloud is transforming the industry and what that means to you. Now, here's your host, Tony Safoyan. So a couple of weeks ago, I realized that SADA was about to turn 20, 20 years old, 20 years of existence. And I thought that I'd sit down and write some reflections. Those reflections ended up being 14 pages, which we will publish. But one of the things we wanted to do was take over Cloud and Clear, episode 60, and turn it into essentially an ebook reading of those 14 pages. So here we go, and we hope that you enjoy it. Happy 20 years, Sada. We're just getting started. On August 16th, 2020, Sada turns a page on 20 years of existence. In any other year, we would bring in our 20th anniversary with a grand celebration. We would host a huge party with hundreds of our closest friends, customers, and partners. But this year, circumstances deem it necessary to replace our usual jubilee with something entirely different. Out of this global pandemic, we can't help but reflect on some of the most profound social and economic challenges that many of us have ever faced. To honor our 20th anniversary, our contribution to our people, to our partners, to our customers, to the ecosystem is this letter. First, we hope it finds you and the people you care about well. We hope it answers some of the questions many of you have asked. We hope it provides you with the lens into how we got here, what we've learned, and what's next. Finally, we hope it highlights our gratitude for everyone in the Sada family, past, present, and future. How we got here. Before we dive into what we learned and what's ahead, I'd like to share the story of how we got here. By every measure, Sada represents the American dream. In this case, Armenian immigrants fled the Soviet Union in 1987 with a child and did everything ambitious, educated immigrants would do in pursuit of a better life. They learned the language, sought new skills, sacrificed leisure, and worked every waking hour to give their child the highest pedestal possible. They chose to start from the bottom in their mid-30s so their only son would not have to. My father, Hobik Safoyan, came from the world of mainframe computing and applied mathematics. He introduced me to technology very early on. I fell in love with technology, even though my parents hoped I would choose a career path in medicine, which, by the way, all children of Armenian immigrants are expected to become doctors. <laughs> there was no other options. My mother worked as a bookkeeper. She was amazing at it. When the firm she worked for relocated to New Jersey, she was out of work for a while. So she began to tinker with the same computer I learned on, a $3,000 386 clone, which they spent more money on than all the furniture in the house. Turning zero experience into an amazing small business, my mother did graphic design work for real estate agents and other printers. Very few people had these skills in the digital world. Here was my mom making groundbreaking strides as a woman in the industry from the very start. In the year 2000, my father started SADA with three other partners, all family and friends. When the company I was working at, TicketClub.com, notice the .com, began to run out of funding, like all businesses were doing at the time, I decided to move home to help with the family business. At the time, SADA worked primarily in .NET-based software. Using my basic computer networking knowledge, I knew I could add value to the family business. Shortly after, in 2003, my mom's company, GraphicsWorks, joined forces with SADA, taking on the SADA name. I was named CEO of SADA after the other partners decided they could not focus on the company anymore. With no funding, little experience, lots of ambition, and just enough naivete, I embarked on a path to move away from the break-fix model of computer and networking repair of the time. We adopted a fixed fee monthly model, better known today as managed services. I may have invented it, although I can't be certain, nobody's proven it otherwise. This maneuver created my passion for business models that drive recurring, predictable revenue while aligning incentives with customers. Waiting for things to break, only to go back and fix them at a high cost, seemed backwards to me. Our graphics works roots pulled us into web development in the early 2000s. We had networking systems chops, designers, we had developers, a novel mix. We started selling required hardware and software, becoming a one-stop shop to our managed services customers. We were a gold-certified Microsoft partner that Microsoft didn't even know existed. 
Around this time, we realized that the managed services approach was very hard to scale. We had a great set of SoCal customers, but how do you manage logistics around supporting customers far away? Do you drive to them all the time to do preventive maintenance and respond quickly when they're down? Zero I was born. We took a couple of existing customers who had Microsoft Exchange, Files, and Office, and we hosted their applications from a data center in downtown LA. We served them only with Citrix and Terminal Server, allowing us to serve them centrally. There was nothing on site that could break. We quickly learned how expensive this was to build and how difficult it was to provide security and an uptime SLA. So we rolled them back on premises. Zero I had failed, but we kept those customers, a testament to our relationships and overall value we brought. At this time, around 2005, 2006, somewhere in a random airline magazine, I saw an ad for Google Enterprise and their search appliance. I remember thinking, Google has an enterprise business? The idea of starting a practice that could change how users in companies quickly access their information, like we did with Google.com, was magical. We paid $10,000, a fortune to us at the time, to join the Google Partner Program. We obtained a search appliance to test, build upon, and sell with. We developed some pretty cool connectors to Microsoft Exchange and Active Directory. Google Enterprise team was impressed. Their team was around 50 people back then, but we had believers. Scott McMullen, Jeff Ragusa, Dave Girard, Michael Locke. To this day, I feel an overwhelming sense of gratitude to them. We were tiny and unknown, but they saw something special. We sold zero search appliances. None of the customers with a small headcount of 50 to 100 employees could afford or justify a server with a $30,000 price tag. However, Google had an upcoming product launch and were impressed with our Microsoft platform expertise. They didn't know anyone else like us in the ecosystem. In 2006, Google Apps for Your Domain went live, and SADA was launched onto the world stage. We immediately began doing work for customers who were 100 times larger than the ones we were used to working with. Our scope expanded outside of SoCal immediately, and we began executing projects all around the country and all around the world. No one else knew how to deploy Google Apps at that scale. Most of our customers were in education, public sector, and telecommunications. Northwestern University was the second large organization ever to deploy Google Apps, and it was SADA who took them there. 13 years later, they're still running it. In 2009, as soon as we could sell and implement Google Apps, which is now G Suite, to commercial customers, we did. Google's mid-market team had just two salespeople, Mike Sutherland, who covered East, and Mike Lee, who covered West. They trusted us, and we closed some great deals. This was the start of our commercial business with Google. Around the same time, a couple of people from Microsoft called and said, hey, you're a gold-certified Microsoft partner. Why are you making such a splash with Google? It was easy. If you wanted cloud email, Google had the only answer. Lo and behold, they were launching BPOS, which became Office 365. They didn't have many partners who deployed what would become millions of users in cloud email. They recognized our hunger and saw clarity in our vision. They too invested heavily in us during the early days. Eric Trimble and Jay Dixon saw something in us that nobody else from Microsoft had. Judson Altoff, Jenny Flinders, Dave Willis, Vahe Tarosian, Margo Day decided to put us on a big stage in the world of Microsoft in meaningful ways. All of a sudden, we were a top partner in both ecosystems. We divided into two separate sales and delivery organizations, both to increase specialization and to minimize conflict in the field. We never wanted the Microsoft or Google sellers to think we would sell customers anything other than their respective products and services. That's ride or die. This is a rare dynamic as most partners are agnostic. It worked. It continues to work. For the next 10 years, we ran both a Google Cloud and a Microsoft Cloud business, with some other key partnerships mixed in, of course, with lots of growth and accolades along the way to show for it. However, in 2019, we announced that we're going to go all in with Google. The reasons behind this have been well documented, so I won't go into that now. But for that decade, in both ecosystems, we kept performing in ways that the market did not think we could. Punching above our weight class became part of our brand. Since we started with basic networking and email, no one thought we could figure out voice. When Skype for Business and Teams became a thing, we became experts in voice. We didn't have a lot of cloud infrastructure expertise, but when Azure became important, 
It represented the majority of our pipeline before we sold the business. With Google, starting from search and then G Suite, we insisted on going to market with Maps in 2011, 2013. Conventional wisdom supported the notion that this business segment was best served by GIS specialists, not cloud companies like Sada. Time and time again, we were told we could not be great at the next thing if we were exceptionally good at the other thing. We never believed that. That's one of the things that makes us unique. We believed we could figure out tough engineering problems and invent new business models. We had strong instincts about where the market was going. We trusted data, but even more than that, we trusted our gut. By every measure, our belief in our abilities continues to serve us. Our success can be seen in back-to-back global accolades from Google Cloud, market validation by CRN and Inc. 5000, and other respective publications that set the standard in our industry. Rest assured, Sada's accolades are backed up by growth of over 65% compounded annually for 15 years. This growth is all organic driven with no slowdown in sight. For that, I'm very grateful. And after 20 years in business, we're just getting started. But more on that later. What we learned along the way. It's fair to say we never expected to get here. Even if we had, there's no way that this is all part of some master plan. I would be lying if I said that we strategically laid out a 20-year plan to get where we are today. It took a ton of grit and hard work, not only from the family, but each and every employee that passed through the doors at SADA. We experimented a lot. We pivoted regularly. We had strong convictions, but loosely held when necessary. One thing has been consistent. The absolute desire and commitment to be best in class in everything we do. That was there in the beginning and it is paramount today. Through the foundation of everyone's tireless work, we're able to capitalize on incredible timing, and yes, some luck. We've learned a few things that, at least right now, I believe to be universal truths. Number one, it's important to be on the right side of history. There was nothing in our pedigree or experience that suggested the likelihood of Sada being revered as a thought leader in the new cloud computing paradigm that took shape in the mid-2000s. It's more likely that because of our small footprint in the industry, our bet on cloud didn't feel like a massive risk. Sure, every customer we migrated to cloud email meant one less traditional managed services customer, even though we could no longer charge to maintain their on-premise systems. So what? The market shift was inevitable. It wasn't difficult to grasp the concept that making several small bets to test hypotheses, markets, and technology stacks was a good idea. We understood and appreciated that our industry had no respect for legacy. It only respects innovation and embraces the reality that the only constant in life is change. Companies and industries across the broad spectrum of business should have gone big into G Suite or Office 365 trends in the mid-2000s, but very few did. Number two, niches are powerful because fewer competitors are better than many. When you're small, look, SADA is still very small. We just have 250 employees, but a lot of people think we have thousands. It is important to carve out a niche. If you're in a business where you want to be good at everything or the lowest cost provider, that's a very hard goal to attain. When you can't differentiate your superpowers, it all comes down to rapid scale, which requires a tremendous amount of capital and price, which requires extremely high levels of efficiency. We were self-funded and wanted to stay that way. So how do you build extreme efficiencies in a market that moves your cheese monthly? You can't, unless you're willing to perpetually lose money. This was not something we were willing or able to do. We picked a lane and became the best in the world at it. Then we expanded our offerings, but only in ways that felt natural and adjacent. We tested some, but never went too far in pursuing shiny objects. We took small risks when the ROI seemed to be there but never took risks that compromised the economic viability of the company. Before we truly found our niche, we tried all sorts of new angles. There was a time we thought we wanted to get into the voice business when voice became data. That's the whole IP telephony transformation. As it turned out, voice was not quite adjacent enough. We had to wait until voice became cloud. Number three, if you're not the brand, align yourself with one, ride or die. Small, Unknown, regional, self-funded, immigrant, inexperienced CEO with a philosophy degree. How do you make a name for yourself? 
make alliances with the biggest names in the world and perfect execution on the value chain that the other big brands bring to market. We were not Microsoft. We were not Google. We are, however, a very significant part of the value that customers receive from these brands. It's not just an affiliation. It's an obsession. Sada is ride or die. And that makes all the difference. From day one, we could only be successful by making our partners successful, which required us to make customers successful first. The recognition that comes from this level of alignment is more valuable than any branding we could have done in the early days. That is, until you're big enough. Six years ago or so, we finally gained the bandwidth to direct efforts on Sada's brand with a real focus on marketing and inside sales. After a certain size, we could not lean solely on being brought customers from outside the organization. When sourcing your own business, building a differentiated brand becomes more and more valuable as you grow. The market wants to know what you stand for, especially as others enter the space. Differentiation in the eyes of your team members, your existing customers, and prospective new business opportunities is critical. We've maintained our ride or die alignment strategy with our existing partnership with Google Cloud while building our own brand and sourcing our own business. While highly unconventional, there are many, many good reasons for this. Not all well understood, and we kind of like it that way. Number four, over the long term, people are everything. Culturally, we have always loved people. We would do anything for our people. That comes from the Safoyan family roots. For instance, my mom provided catered homemade lunches for our folks back in 2002, 2003, way before Silicon Valley ever did. We see our people as an extension of our family more than anything. This business is only successful because of our people. When we talk about strategy these days, we focus on mastering these three things in this order. People experience, customer experience, partner experience. Without the first, you can't master the second. Without the second, your partners don't see the value in what you do. In the last few years, and even more so in the midst of this pandemic and beyond, as CEO, I obsess over making our people experience at SADA absolutely best in class. At every touch point in the entire employee life cycle, from the first recruiter call to the offer or rejection, to the first week, the first month, the first quarter, first year, and 10 years down the line to the very last day, I want everyone to think, quote, my time at SADA was the most valuable in my life, both professionally and personally, end quote. This is the end goal. We spend an immeasurable amount of time and effort on these endeavors. Our people operations team launches and maintains several related and integrated programs to deliver the growth mindset we know the market expects. Over the course of your time at SADA, regardless of tenure, we want you to experience diversity, equity, and inclusion programs, some optional, some required. Our benefits keep getting better as we emphasize work-life harmony. This is a huge undertaking at a company of SADA size growing so quickly, but we care and we make it a priority. If a team member decides to move away from SADA, we want it to be for one reason only. They've done everything they could here, both professionally and personally. That's it. When our team members end up at places like Apple, Google, Microsoft, Deloitte, Okta, or wherever, we are proud of that. As such, we recently launched a formal alumni network. The alumni network is our legacy. I don't believe leaders have preset limits on what they can accomplish and how much they can grow. Many companies approach this with the mindset, well, this leader never had a sales team this big or a team this big or this much responsibility. So let's go and find somebody from the outside that already has this experience. I've always thought this to be the wrong approach in building talent. Everyone can grow and everyone can become 1% better each day. I'm living proof of this. I've never run a company of SADA size. Instead of dwelling on this, my mindset is to identify what I need to do to make sure I stay prepared and qualified for where SADA will be 10 years from now. It's important to create a healthy mix of existing leaders with years of experience under their belt, new executives in roles that didn't exist before, and people early and midway through their careers. Elevating people from within as much as possible and bringing in new and diverse teams to spur continued evolution and creativity is key. Then, 
Just rinse and repeat all the time. The newest part of the strategy is the launch of SADA University. Yes, I think we need a cooler name. But think of SADA U as a paid three to four month onboarding program for junior talent who get to be cross-trained with existing SADIans into the role within the organization. It's the real deal. We have a dean with an actual curriculum, a program, tests, expectations. The first cohort is in session right now. They're all data engineers and all but one are women. I can't wait to scale as we prove out this model. Moving on to my executive members, the EMT. They are everything to me and the engine of our business operations. They're the right mix of people who grew from within, people from the outside, and from all walks of life. They are in the trenches every day, taking on experiences from other places, applying them to a market that has no preset rule book, investing, challenging, creating, and executing. We are ride or die for each other, and that's truly magical. My parents, the founders, my family, my rocks are fully engaged. They come through and show up for all of us exactly how and where we need them. We've recently added outside independent board members to the mix to hold me and the EMT accountable while giving us exceptional strategic guidance and insight. Holding an otherwise self-funded private company accountable in this way is an exceptional show of responsibility for the future of SADA. People will eternally be the most important part of how we differentiate ourselves. If we don't do this better than others, We can't be the best in the ecosystem, period. Number five, you can become the best in the world at something you've never done before. Can you guess how many times we've been told we wouldn't be able to do X? Can you guess how many times we were told that the only way to get into practice X is to acquire a company that already does X? Obviously, this feedback is complete bullshit. This happens often when you're known in the industry to be the best at a particular thing. People take on this absurd belief that you can't do something else equally well. It's a bias we battle for 15 plus years, although these days we don't hear it as much. This does not diminish the importance of entering into well-aligned markets and choosing the right practices to build capabilities in. For us, the litmus test is very simple. Is this an offering our partner is building a solution for? Is it cloud? Do our customers need it? Then we deploy what we call the micro-investment strategy. I've given talks on this. It's a build it or buy it debate that always happens. Not all of them work, but many of them do. Here is a list of things we would never have built capabilities in if we listened to conventional wisdom. In the Microsoft business unit, there's Link, Skype, Teams, We were told, oh, you don't know voice. What happened? At some point, we were deploying up to 10% of all the Teams activations in North America. Dynamics Online. Oh, you're not a traditional Dynamics partner. You can't do this because you don't know the on-premise Dynamics world. What happened? We built a good team and won some major deals. Azure. Reason given? Oh, you only know email. You only know Office 365. What happened? I remember right before we sold the company, the majority of our pipeline and the highest revenue growth was in Azure. In the Google business unit, we were told we couldn't do enterprise-sized deployments of G Suite in the commercial space. Reason given, we were too small. The only big deals we'd done was education and public sector. What was the result? The Colgate moment that changed everything. Not just for SADA, but for G Suite's credibility in the general enterprise game, period. That's me jumping up in the air, doing a fist pump in the video, the moment Micro name dropped SADA on the biggest stage there was for our ecosystem. I fully understood what that moment meant. Multi-regional go-to-market relevance. Reason given, you're an LA-based company, you're a West Coast company. The result, we have nine offices. We're a significant player in every region and sub-region for Google Cloud in North America. Google Maps, reason given, Maps is a direct business. You can only partner if you're a GIS consulting company. What was the result? SADA became and still is the world's largest Maps partner in the world. Three times that of the second player in the space. Our first global level accolade from Google was in fact in Maps in 2014, the global partner of the year for Google Maps. This would not have been possible without Paula Stoyne, Rosemary Cremesi, Monik Dar, Jay Remley, Francisco Rao, Justin Knight. We'll never forget. 
Now let's talk about Google Cloud Platform, GCP. Back in the days, reason given? GCP is not for resellers or MSP. It's difficult, it's big, it's complex. You're a G Suite and Maps partner, you'll never get it. Result? The largest seller of Google Cloud technologies in the world, two years in a row. Also, GCP is now our largest business by far. Thank you to Thomas Kurian, Rob Enslin, Kirsten Kliphouse, Janet Kennedy, Thomas Garant, who believed in our GCP capabilities before anyone else did. And of course, Carolee Gerhardt, Amy Catalano, Nina Harding, Kati, Kyle Campbell, Kishan, Brett Mitchell, Narav, Rob Harper, and the best partner development manager in the world, Ahmed Shama. Thank you for an amazing partnership. We know we're not easy. We're trying to colonize Mars in equal terms of our ambition in our space. You inspire us every day. You make us want to get better every day. And if I truly had to capture everyone that we work with, everyone that we're thankful for at Google, we'd have hundreds of names. But I do apologize if I missed anyone. Nobody in the Google Cloud ecosystem looks like Sada today. Nobody has eight or nine figure businesses in Maps, G Suite, and GCP. And nobody can both sell and deliver those technologies in a best-in-class, enterprise-grade, professional services, and managed services manner. Talk about a niche. I hope my point is coming through clearly. Don't let anyone tell you what you can and can't accomplish. Experiment safely. There are dozens of things we tried that didn't end up serving us in the long or short term. None of those experiments broke the company. If we had not experimented with strategies we believed in, we would not have continued to grow 65% a year. This year, we will grow 100%. Number six, growing a company in a market that's growing is easy. Win a bunch of new customers every year and never lose your existing ones. Honestly, this is the playbook. After we win a customer, we put in 10 times more effort than we did to retain them. To win a customer, you need excellent marketing, proven pipeline sourcing capabilities, great sales teams, fantastic legal expertise, pre-sale engineering, and so on. But to keep them, you also need best-in-class teams in all the following areas. Project management, professional services engineering, change management, adoption, and training, technical account management, customer success, client partner executives, account management, enterprise support, in order for these teams to deliver excellence, you need excellent leadership. Those are the hard facts. And there are soft elements, like accountability to the executives at the top, responsiveness, and the willingness to talk to any customer at any time. And that includes me. Here's my Google voice number, 818-492-4410. Call or text me anytime. I mean it. That's how we roll. Don't let your executives get too far removed from customers. That never ends well. If you do a fantastic job at creating raving fan customers, it's far easier to call upon them when they're needed to help you win the new one. Keeping customers gives you investment capacity to fund a continued expansion of people, coverage, and capabilities. It is a wonderfully virtuous cycle. It's been the cornerstone of how SADA works, and that will never change. Number seven, deliberate incentive alignment creates indestructible virtuous cycles. I've never understood business models that are a zero-sum game or behave as one. Professionally and personally, I strongly believe when two or more things come together, it's always possible to create new value and that operating with a scarcity mindset is in fact destructive. I've always believed it's possible to create scenarios where everyone wins. This is how I feel about the work we do at SADA. The nuances of how our business works at the most fundamental level are intentionally designed to produce multi-way wins. It's virtually impossible for SADA to make any money, let alone grow, unless we drive more value to our customers than we get. And it's impossible for us to be successful unless we make Google Cloud successful. We can't just hire someone and not be completely dedicated to making them thrive. We can't just sell a solution to a customer, charge them a lot of money, and leave. This value must be delivered at all times for everyone we serve, including our SADA team members, our customers, and the Google Cloud organization. If any of these people, companies, or partners we serve can't win, this model is rendered unsustainable. 
This is how the cloud business works for customers. It's the best of the managed services mindset, shared risk, shared rewards, customers for life, but a thousand times bigger and more impactful. The go-to-market cycle is like this. Customer buys something from SADA slash Google Cloud. SADA Google Cloud does everything possible to demonstrate value to that customer. If we don't, that customer will never buy from us again. If we do, not only will they buy more, but they'll be a great reference and a story. Then we get paid, our people get paid, Google Cloud gets paid. We take what's left and we reinvest. More engineers, more sellers, more capabilities, more infrastructure, better systems, better rewards for everyone who helps. Then the question is, how do you kickstart a virtuous cycle? Part of this is just a business model design, but the other part of this is an inherent philosophy. You give first. We don't try to charge as much as possible. We don't try to pay our people as little as possible. We don't try to get more from Google than we give. No, we give, we invest, we promote, we do the work first. If you want to build a forever company and create an unbreakable virtue cycle, aligning incentives correctly is imperative. Number eight, it's all about you, but not in the way you're thinking. There are many celebrated leaders CEOs and founders who took their organizations to the top by leaning in on a cult of personality. Whether or not they were good people is unclear. Now, if you're Elon Musk or Steve Jobs, that's fine. There are people that are so exceptionally gifted that they can be highly productive like this, and it works. And thank God for them. The world would be very different without them. They are the exception, and most of us, myself included, do not fall into this category of people. There are many more stories of leaders who believed they were the company and made it completely about them, driven by an immense sense of responsibility, lots of stress, potentially blinded by early success and admiration. They get very full of themselves. The ego takes over. They believe they can behave with no regard to those around them and that the world will bend to their will. It can work for a while, but inevitably it breaks. It breaks them and oftentimes it breaks the company. Indeed, company leaders feel a tremendous amount of responsibility all the time. This often leads to forgetting the criticality of staying grounded. We forget the necessities of kindness, humility, self-care, sleep, diet, exercise, family, healthy outlets for stress, and so on. Balance. Living the core values of SADA and leading by example can have positive long-term effects on everyone with outsized results. So yes, it is all about you. If you're off your game, everyone suffers. Be assured, after a certain period of time or a certain level of success, you are no longer doing this for you. You've done well. You've built something great. But now, thousands of organizations, hundreds of thousands of people are depending on you, including the people who work for you. If you can't sustain this brand of leadership, pass the torch with a solid succession plan, I hope but never let success get to your head or make you complacent. It's the death knell of any successful organization. I've seen it a dozen times. At the brink of breakout success, a leader will overstay their welcome, overextend themselves, break down, and take the company down with them. As long as I'm in, I'm in 100% and I'm leading by example. I'm committed to taking exceptionally good care of myself so I can bring my best to the people who depend on me. The moment I can no longer do this, I am out. But rest assured, I'm very, very far away from that. People ask, why not sell the company and just live happily ever after? I can't. I'm too happy and fulfilled being the CEO of SADA. We have too much to do. I have too much passion for what we do. Most importantly, most importantly, we really took the time to define this burning desire in terms of our just cause, like Simon Sinek. We feel duty bound to stay in the game. Our just cause is why we're still in the game. To increase the capabilities of the people and the performance of the organizations we serve. After 20 years, and what is now a significant sphere of influence, we're more driven than ever by our just cause. We feel duty bound to move the world forward, starting with our own people who reach new heights every day, personally, competently, and economically. And guess what? 250 people today will be over 300 by the end of 2020, and we'll have 500 plus in a couple of years. That's a lot of people we get to take on this journey with us, 
who get to do meaningful work they can be proud of, increasing their happiness, sense of achievement, and seeing the results of their impact on our customers firsthand. We're in the midst of the largest technological paradigm shift in the history of time. And it's not just about moving to the cloud. It's about how and to what degree our customers get to transform by virtue of this journey. This is amplified by the current pandemic and economic uncertainty. COVID-19 has created a digital compression algorithm that has rocked the business world. Digital transformation had become something people poke fun at until the pandemic. Now the choice for every traditional enterprise customer is clear. Become a digital business or die. You no longer have five to 10 years to do this. You must do this now. It's now ultra clear what being a digital enterprise means. We have hundreds of these types of customers. These organizations are experiencing something completely different than those who didn't make these changes. There's magic in working with Google Cloud. Nobody chooses to buy Google Cloud technologies and then not implement. It never happens like it used to with enterprise software. And no customers who deploy Google Cloud technologies, nor the people that make those decisions, stay the same. They are forever transformed and always for the better. There is unlimited demand for this kind of work in the foreseeable future. 10 plus years, as far as I can see. We can't stop now. Now more than ever, we are going to play an even larger, more visible role in the most profound technological narrative and society at large. In aligning with our core values, we committed to the call for diversity, equity, and inclusion. Focus acutely on improving inequalities in the Black community and women's rights. I'm the father of two girls. I've been largely influenced by strong, successful women. My mom, my aunts, my grandmother, my cousin. You'll see systemic changes in how we show up for these issues. Our impact will be felt for years to come. Being black in America shouldn't come with a price tag of oppression and inequality. It's completely unacceptable, and we can make a difference. In addition to external recruitment efforts, like our recent alliance with the National Society of Black Engineers, we will commit to internally developing and mentoring a diverse, inclusive talent pipeline for SADA and others. That's the idea behind the launches of PartnerCareers.com and SADA University. These initiatives are bringing authentic change for the future footprint of inclusion in our industry. We realize that the game we're in is an infinite game. It's very early. We have to stay in the game. The work we do means too much for us to stop or sell the company or slow our growth. The market needs us. Our thousands of existing customers need us. Some of the brightest and best minds have a home here now and into the future where they will be given the opportunity to have an outsized impact on customers and the people that work there. So cheers to the next 20 years. We're building a forever company in an infinite game. We've done a vast amount of impactful work so far, and we have lots more to do. In gratitude, Tony Safoyan. Thank you for listening to Cloud and Clear. Check the show notes for links to this week's topics. And don't forget to connect with us on Twitter at Cloud and Clear and our website, sada.com. Be sure to rate and review the show on your favorite podcast app. 